Welcome everyone to our core facility seminar series. For those of you who do not know me, I am Lisa Korpieski, the Director of Communications and Marketing here at the Institute for Applied Life Sciences. Today, we will be learning about the advanced spectroscopy analysis services available in our new core from Lily Hay, the Director of the Raman IR XRF spectroscopy facility. This new core facility has the capabilities to analyze versatile organic and inorganic samples, including agricultural, environmental, food, and biomedical materials, as well as polymers and heavy metals. We are hoping that with these biweekly seminars, you will discover what great resources that the centralized UMass core facilities offer to our campus community, the New England region, and beyond. Just a few housekeeping items. This seminar is being recorded. If you miss any part of this seminar or would like to forward it to someone who could not attend, there will be a replay of this and all previous seminars in this series on our website. I will put the link in the chat. I recommend you set your view mode to speaker. Please stay muted during the talks. We will save the Q&A until the end of the presentation. During that time, I welcome you to unmute yourself and ask your question. Also, you can put your questions into the chat, which I will be monitoring. Thank you. Next up, I would like to introduce you to Andrew Bernard, Director of our UMass Amherst Core Facilities. Andrew? Thank you, Lisa. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. As Lisa mentioned, my name is Andrew Bernard, and I'm the Director of our Centralized Core Facilities here at UMass Amherst. This is our eighth and second to last seminar of the semester, and we're busy planning for the spring. I'm proud of how well they've gone and how, how well they've been received and, and hope that continues. If there are cores or specific technologies you would like us to feature, whether they be part of the centralized core portfolio or not, please let us know by filling out the form that will be circulated after the seminar and also will be in the chat shortly. Uh, the goal is to make these events interactive. So as Lisa mentioned, there'll be a, a, a engagement at the end. So please feel free to put your questions in the chat and we'll get to them as soon as the Q&A opens up. If you've not interacted with us much, the UMass core facilities are open to anyone from undergrads through senior scientists, regardless of affiliation, including researchers from other academic institutions and commercial partners. From sending samples for analysis to designs for 3D printing, to becoming a trained user on advanced imaging instrumentation, there are many opportunities for engagement, no matter your level of expertise. Additionally, there are many opportunities to fund your work in the course. For UMass users, there are several seed funding programs and core credits available to all IELTS faculty members. And for our external users, the Mass Innovation Voucher Program subsidizes usage for small companies based in Massachusetts at up to 75%. Over the last two years, across the five UMass campuses, we have awarded more than 400 vouchers, representing more than $5 million in project costs. If you happen to be a Mass Bio member, there's also a 10% discount you may be eligible for. We are here to be your partner and to help expand your research productivity. Please feel free to reach out to me or any of the core facility directors if you have questions or would like more information on how to engage. Now it's my pleasure to turn the reins over to Dr. Lily Hay, Associate Professor of the Department of Food Science and Director of the Raman IR XRF Spectroscopy Facility, which is the newest core to join our centralized core portfolio. I'm excited to hear and learn more about this and hope you are as well. Dr. Hay? Thank you, Andrew, and thank you, Lisa. So what we do, we provide advanced Raman IR and XRF spectroscopic analysis of organic and inorganic samples, such as agricultural, environmental, food, biomaterial, biomedical materials, as well as polymers and metals. Currently, we have eight different instruments, four Raman, two IR, and two XRF. The Raman and IR are complementary molecular spectroscopy. We have two Raman microscope. Both of them has dual laser capabilities, and they are with a confocal microscope for automatic sampling and with one micron resolution. The one on the right it is desired for fast imaging. Two spectrometer. The one on the left is a high resolution Raman spectrometer with a fiber optical probe. The one on the right is a handheld spectrometer. So basically you just point and shoot. Two FTIR, one is spectrometer, one is a microscope, can do imaging analysis. And both of them has ATR capability. Two X-ray for resin spectrometer for inorganic element analysis. 
The Epsilon 4 can measure one sample at a time, and it is portable, battery powered. Epsilon 1 has a molten sampling capability and it can measure as light as a sodium. We also have two equipment coming up. Um, this is a mini Raman spectrometer. The size is as small as a cell phone. A X-ray analytical microscope that can do both X-ray transmission imaging and XRF elemental mapping with 10 micron resolution. So the services we provide, not only for industry collaborations, consultation, project design, grant support, user training, service is advanced analysis. The unique aspect of our core is we also provide services for search application and substrate development and evaluation. So SIRS stands for Surface Enhanced Raman Spectroscopy. I will talk more about it in my research talk. So this picture is Josh. Josh is our core facility manager. He is excellent. He's very knowledgeable and very efficient. So he will be the one that um, do the most analytical work. A little, bit, a little bit more background about myself. Um, my primary appointment with the university is a faculty in the Department of Food Science. So over the years, I have accumulated different instrument and probably I'm the only one that has the Raman microscope capabilities. So I have receiving a lot of requests from other department outside campus to use my instrument. So in the beginning, I would say, okay, yeah, everyone use it for free. But gradually, once getting more and more, and also my, my own research group is growing and getting quite a few different uh, grants, then I don't think I will be able to manage that. So last year, after I um, finished all the three major USD um, grants, and then I was thinking about doing a little bit different for my lab. So with the help of IELTS, I established uh, these core facilities for Raman Iron XRF. I think these core facilities not only will provide services to campus and elsewhere, it also benefit to my own research and make my research more sustainable. And also it's a good opportunity for me to establish uh, the collaborations with other faculty and industry. So my research interest is in developing analytical, novel analytical techniques for the analysis of a variety of different things like chemicals, microbes, engineered nanomaterials, microplastics in complex matrices. And my expertise is um, lies in the chemical imaging, the fabrication of nanostructures, molecular interaction, methodology integration and the chemometric state of fusion. So I will talk about uh, um, part of my research on Raman source for chemical analysis in today's seminar. The Raman spectroscopy uses a laser light to shoot samples and most of the light will be scattered and contain the same information as the laser light. So they are called Raleigh scattering. A very small portion of the light will shift, which contains the information from the samples. So different samples, molecules has different vibration. So you'll get this kind of molecular fingerprinting. Raman and IR, they are complementary molecular spectroscopy. For Raman, it's more sensitive to the polarizability change, which can be translated to more sensitive to this kind of a symmetric vibrating like uh, in these pictures. So non-polar bonds, backbone structures are more sensitive in Raman. IR is complementary, it's more sensitive to the dipole moment, so asymmetric vibration. So those kind of functional groups will be more sensitive to measures in the IR. So here I want to take a, um, a, a small project I did with uh, DSM. So DSM is a company specialized in nutrition, 
health and sustainable living. So we have done a small project. And all the data I show here received approval from the company to show to the public. So there's nothing confidential with the company. And the purpose is just to show the capability of the Raman spectroscopy in the chemical analysis. So we received the several samples, um, lutein and the zeaxanthin. So those two are carotenoids, isomers. The only difference is here, see this double bond here and the zeaxanthin double bond here. So basically zeaxanthin has one more number of conjugated double bonds in the system. And the Raman, as I said before, is more sensitive to those backbone structures. So those carotenoids are the pigments, the antioxidants that we the conjugated double bond systems are very sensitive to be measured with the Raman spectroscopy. So the small project is trying to see whether the Raman spectroscopy is able to differentiate between these two isomers and to quantify them in the mixture and the characterize of the heat responses, as well as map out the distribution in the encapsulation. So we received the seven samples. The, here I just show four samples. Sample one is 1% 1 of routine. Sample two is 1% 1 of the sensing. Sample four is a mixture. And sample seven is oil control. So 1%, the other 99% is oil. So as you can see here, Although 99% is oil, the oil spectrum is almost silenced here in the routine on their sending spectrum, which means the Raman is very, very sensitive to specifically to routine and their sensing. So they can measure these molecules directly in the mixture, even at 1% with 99% of oil, but you can just selectively measure out these target molecules very clearly. So compare routine and their sensing, we can see one big difference is their sensing has a higher intensity than routine, which is makes sense because their sensing has one more conjugated double bonds. The more conjugated double bonds, the more sensitive to Raman. But the difference is, is, is quite big. So I suspect there's something else plays in the role, like concentration. And in addition to the intensity difference, if you zoom in to some specific areas, you can also see there's a shifting at certain wave numbers. So that's also because the little bit difference in the two isomers cause the molecular vibration different. So that the Raman is very sensitive to differentiate this tiny bit molecular vibration. So to accurately quantify the concentration in the product, so we use the standard to establish a standard curve to predict sample one, and we find it out it is actually 0.9%. We also had the standard of their sensing and to quantify the sample two, that is actually 1.37%. So that makes sense that we see the big intensity differences coming from two things. One is the concentration is different. The other one is their sensing is more sensitive than routine. We can also establish a standard curve um, for the mixture to quantify uh, the composition in the mixture. So the next we do is we see if there's a difference is that the Raman spectroscopy can tell between um, the routine and heated routine. Like after heating, whether there's molecular degradation, right? So this is sample one, the sample three is after heating and the zoom in, you can see after the heating, there's a significant change in the spectrum that's indicated the molecular degradation. So same thing for the mixture. The trend is the same. And over the different uh, 
time you can actually establish a kinetics um, to study the kinetics of degradation. And these change can be quantified. So the next um, study is to map out the distribution of the routine in encapsulation. So this is the optical imaging that this is a um, capsule. And we just take, take an area to try to map out um, the distribution of routine in the capsule. So the first things we did is we map out the oil in the particles. So again, oil has very little peaks here, so only here that indicated oil. And this is called chemical imaging, so where the laser has scanned through the samples and the color, the blue color, that is the lowest intensity. The red color indicated the highest intensity. So just by looking at the range that we can see not much differences. The range is very narrow, which means the oil distribution is uniform. Then we placed the bars to the characteristic peak of lutein, and we can see the range changed from 1,000 intensity to 11,000 intensity. So because the intensity change is very large, so we can get the conclusion is the distribution is not uniform here. So here I just show you the, the example of using the Raman spectroscopy. You can not only sensitive tell to isomers, and particularly for the molecule that has conjugate double bonds systems is extremely sensitive to for Raman spectroscopy for the analysis. Uh, we can do quantification study. We can also use the uh, Raman microscope to do the chemical mapping to study the distribution of the chemical within the sample. So next I want to talk about the SIRS, surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy. SIRS is a marriage between Raman spectroscopy and the nanotechnology. So in addition that you need to have this Raman instrument, you also need to have some nano structures. These nano structures, once you have the samples interact or placed on the surface, that will get enhanced signals. So for the Raman spectroscopy, itself alone, except that the conjugate double bonds actually compared with IR is not that sensitive. And also it has a limitation of fluorescence interference. But SIRS can overcome these two problems. It uses nano, nano substrate to enhance the signal significantly. The lower is can go to single molecule detection. It also suppress the fluorescence interference. So the nano substrate is the key um, in addition to the instrument to play with these techniques. So again, nano technology will help enhance the sensitivity, selectivity, and the capability for characterization of the Raman spectroscopy. Raman spectroscopy can also help characterize those nanostructures, detect engineer nanoparticles, and integrated a lot of other techniques, sensoring-based techniques based on the nanotechnology. So overall, SIRS increased uh, uh, a higher dimension of the application. So the, for the nano substrate for the SIRS applications, there are two type of uh, commercial SIRS substrate. The first one is as simple as uh, gold or silver, um, nanoparticle colloids, nanoparticle in the in water in solution. Another type is called a substrate based, where that you can. This is the uh, the first uh, third substrate in the market. So it uses the laser laser graphic to cut the patterns on the silicon wafer, then code the gold nanoparticles on the surface. And over the years you see a more and more commercial search substrate coming into the market. So this is a hot area in a lot of um, 
engineering area, mechanical engineering, chemical engineering, they can fabricate very fancy nano substrate. And one of the application that they can explore is the third substrate. So for any company or any um, faculties in the engineer department, if you have some interesting nano substrate that we can help explore the application of this nano substrate into the third application. So we also develop our own substrate and the more from the application point of view and we believe our substrate is overcame a lot of uh, restraints of the solid substrate. So currently the commercial substrate, they have similarity. Most of them, they are in this kind of a pattern, which when you do the sample analysis, either you just drop your sample liquid on top of the surface, let it dry for the analysis, or you can dip it, dip the substrate into a liquid take it out, let it dry, and do the analysis. But we have some interesting substrate I want to introduce that can expand it, overcome this limitation to do more different type of application. The first one is a silver nanoparticle mirror. So this is one is based on the nanoparticle solution, colloidal solution. And we, has, we have a, um, Media aid solvent is able to push those nanoparticles into a um, monolayer assembled structures at a moving interface. And eventually, this kind of uh, monolayer gold nanoparticles will settle down at the bottom. So you can see the shining part. And then you can use a pipette to take it out and drop on any surface as a coating. So this is uh, the reason we call it nanoparticle mirror is actually, you can see it is um, refracting the light from one direction. So you can actually see my student taking the pictures. Well, if you just drop a nanoparticle colloidal solution on the surface, once it dries, it will move to aggregate on the surface to for the coffee ring, where the edge has the most of aggregation and has the most uh, strongest intensity. But in the middle, you don't have any of signal. So the variation is very, very large, where you see strong signals here, but a little bit away from there, you see significant decrease of the signal. Where for our nanoparticle mirror, it's nanoparticle monolayer, so it can very uniform covered on the surface and provide very uniform signal. So the nanoparticle mirror can drop on any surface as a coating. So you don't need to have a machine to coat it on your samples. So just pick it up and drop on the surface, let it dry. So here you can see, so these are the dropping of the mirror on the spinach leaf surface. And this is the margin, this is center, very uniformly coated. As a compare with if you just drop nanoparticles, where you can see more of aggregation, right? And in the center, just a few. So the mirror is the best source substrate to do the chemical mapping. So you can see here, using the mirror, when we want to map out the distribution of the pesticide on the spinach leaf surface, they are very uniform. And we can probe very low sensitivity and very sensitively. Where the gold nanoparticles itself has a variation. So the pesticide signal will have even larger variation. We can also drop the nanoparticle mirror on any surface, let it dry, use as a substrate based sort of substrate, solid surface based substrate. For example, we drop it on the cap. This cap, we call it mirror in cap substrate. Then use this one, this cap, we can detect uh, 
aroma compound from the garlic. So this one is aroma compound from the garlic. Very simple to do so. Just drop it and let it dry and close it up. The, you can put the garlic powders in the vial. After a few minutes, open it up, flip, then take, shoot the laser. Then you can get a nice spectrum. So it's a very versatile application. The second example is a source fiber or source needle. So we have a technique to code the, um, nano, nano, the, the, the fiber um, with a gold nanoparticle. The fiber is very thin, so it can penetrate it through an injection needle. So we call the whole app, uh, device as a search needle. So the search needle is able to do volatile detections in hot space as well as uh, multi-phase detection and the minimum invasive analysis as traditional collodial-based or uh, solid substrate-based of the substrate is not able to do so. So first I want to show you a study that we use the source fiber, a source needle to determine the freshness of the packaged living green. So we bought a, a living green package. We want to test it out uh, the freshness based on the head space analysis. We can insert it, the fibers into the package. Um, to be clear, we put a leaves and insert it into these vials. Um, and after two hours, we take it out of the fiber and we measure its uh, Raman spectrum. So the, the fiber itself provides a clean background here. And after two hours, we, we see a very high resolution spectrum. So this is from the aroma compound of the fresh arugula in the head space. Then we monitor this uh, head space over time for 14 days and um, to see whether or not we can see some change during different uh, storage day and uh, correlated to its shelf life. So we can see the spectrums from the day zero to 14 days has a significant change. Like these peaks disappeared and there's new peak coming up. So new peak coming up. We established a big database of a variety of different volatile compounds and we find the one matched spectrum from the spoiled leaves. So this spectrum matched with uh, dimethyl disulfide perfectly. So that indicates, so this molecule is actually a bacterial spoilage indicator. So that means our source fiber is able to capture the bacterial spoilage indicator. So that has a strong correlation with the shelf life of the product. To validate that, we take out, uh, we cultured some bacteria and add it back to see if they produce these spectrums. And we can validate that it, it is because of the spoilage bacteria produced this spectrum um, that we are able to capture that. We also established a principal component model to validate the model. We bought another package of the alugula leaves from the grocery stores and we predict using the model and it tells that this package has three to five days shelf life. And after three to five days indeed, and they got spoiled. Some other application I want to show here a little bit is um, for the fibers, it can, because it can insert it into um, the samples which means if your samples has multi-phase, like if your samples is a, a had an oil, water, had an emotion system, as well as your samples has head space, we will be able to do one step multi-phase sampling. So basically just simply insert it into a sample, it will capture the analyte at different part of the fiber. Once you take it out, we just measure at a different part. You can get different information. So one step, you can get all three information about the analyte in the head space, in the water phase, in the organic phase um, for the analysis. 
So it increases the data dimension um, of uh, the sample um, by doing just the one step sampling. Well, previously you need to analyze the gas using the GC, right, the liquid using the LC to obtain the information. But here we're just using the one um, step sampling. You can got all the information from different phases. Another unique aspect of the search needle is because the needle is able to poke into any soft tissues. So not only you can poke into the packaging, right? The packaging or the vials, you can actually poke into um, a softer material like a tomato. So we use this kind of a design to study the internal pesticide uptake of the pesticide and the monitor and the uptaking of the pesticide inside of the tomato without smashing the tomato. So that is um, the application of the Raman search for um, chemical analysis. In addition to chemical analysis, I actually, um, my research um, also including other different areas. So I don't have time to talk in details about other areas. So I just want to show you some snapshot um, of um, the other research project that uh, we have done in the lab. For example, we are using the SIRS mapping to study the bacteria detection. So bacteria, it has a one to three micrometer. So that is about the size of a laser spot. So which means we can scan through the laser the laser hit on of the bacteria cell over the area. So that can generate a, a pixel of the bacteria. And different bacteria has a different fingerprint, like Salmonella, E. coli have a different fingerprint. So not only we can detect single bacteria cells, quantify them, we'll be also able to differentiate between different bacteria cells by using the Raman the source mapping. The nanoparticles, we can play with the nanoparticles. Nanoparticle can conjugate some kind of specific capture to the bacterial cell used as a probe to probe the bacterial cells in a complex matrix. So here we use these kind of conjugate nanoparticles to study the bacteria, a bacteria bacterial cells penetration or internalized bacterial cells in a plant tissues. And we can also um, integrate it with a filtration system where the filter membrane first collect the bacterial cells, then you added nanoparticles, to, uh, you added a capture. These captures can be also contains information that once you add in nanoparticle, it will give out uh, as a, a a labeling information in the source mapping as a way to detect nanoparticle or detect bacteria on the filter membrane. So we also use this search to detect engineered nanomaterials in food and uh, plants. Um, for example, we have a, these uh, label-free techniques. We rely on the nanoparticle and the plant, they have interaction so for example, we found out that gold nanoparticles and the pigment has a strong interaction. So based, based on what the nanoparticle interact, we will, we will be able to map the distribution of the nanoparticle inside of a plant tissues and also characterize the nanoparticle and the plant interaction. For the detections, we can use the filtration um, techniques again to filter it out, those uh, nanoparticles, um, aggregated nanoparticles on a filter membrane. And by adding a label, then we can use uh, the nanoparticle itself that produce the labeling as a way to detect the presence of the nanoparticle. So this is for silver nanoparticle detection. We also have a, a, a project on for um, semiconductor like a titanium dioxide detection Again, the strategy is you need to find a ligand that can bind the nanoparticle. So the ligand 
not only binds the nanoparticle, but also gives you a signal for the source measurement. Oh, and uh, another one. So this is uh, uh, when to use, use the search to detect nanoparticles in commercial product. Another substrate that I, I don't have time to go into detail is this uh, um, membrane-based substrate. We found it has a dual function, not only enhance the Raman, but also enhance the IR. And because uh, the filter membrane is a soft material, so it was actually can be placed the, against the ATR crystal to do the enhanced surface enhanced ATR IR. XRF, so X-ray fluorescence spectroscopy is used for the inorganic um, elemental analysis. So we develop a, a different method to detect uh, arsenic, inorganic arsenic in food samples. And also we use that compared with Raman to study um, the titanium dioxide nanoparticles in the food samples. And this is uh, the uh, acknowledgement um, for the funding support from different uh, federal agencies and companies that uh, um, provided the funding um, for all those uh, research projects. Okay, so um, again, our core facility is not only we can help you measure your samples using these different instrument, but we also can help you solve any analytical problems. Um, and I'm very excited to get this core facility up and running and I'm looking forward to um, assist your research and establish collaborations. Thank you. Great, thank you, Lily. So we have a few questions in the chat already. So do you work with SIRS for depth detection? What wave number range for the 780 NM Raman system? Or perhaps yes. Yeah, so, um, so we we actually using the Raman microscope. So the one DXR DXRI that has a confocal Raman microscope for depth imaging. Um, so basically for that device, because the microscope is confocal, so the machine has a um, control of the Z depths. So we can automatically set the Z depths, let the laser to penetrate through the samples, be able to get the depth profiles from there. But we don't have the SRS, the, 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 the one that uh, is offset laser ones. And in terms of the wave number range, so for the, for the two Raman microscope, we can do 50 to 300, uh, 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 3,400, 3, um, the range for the 780. For the portable one, um, it's, uh, I think it's, uh, four, uh, it's uh, 100 to 2,000 range. Great, we have another question. Can we study the fate of the nanoparticles inside plant tissues or living cells? Yeah, so we actually have um, quite a few papers on there already. So we can study the nanoparticle fate inside of plant cells or living cells. So there's two ways we can study it. Um, if the nanoparticle is a silver or gold nanoparticle, which itself can have a strong source enhancement. So we can monitor the enhanced signal coming from the nanoparticle and the plant or cell interaction as a base to detect those nanoparticles in the plant. We can use uh, the imaging um, to map out the distribution of the nanoparticle. So not only the surface imaging, also the depth imaging to monitoring the penetration kinetics of the nanoparticle into the tissue. Another, um, technique uh, is uh, you need to label the nanoparticles with some label. Um, those labels will be very sensitive to, um, to the source so that you can have a very high sensitivity to map out the distribution of the nanoparticle inside of a plant or the cells. 
Okay, and another one. Do you have replicates of your standards concentrations when you created your standard curve? Yes. So the replicates is very important. So normally, we when we want when we do the the standard curve, so we always need to include uh, the replicates. Um, the I would say at least uh, uh, three independent replicates to generate the the standard curves. So in terms of the quantification, the standard curve established is, uh, is the same as all different techniques that you want to include in the replicates to generate a standard curve. Are there any other questions? Please unmute yourself and ask your question directly. Um, how fast is the Raman imaging? The Raman imaging, um, let me pour it here. So this one, the DXR XI is very fast. Um, it can measure one 600 spectrum in one second. So it depends on how large is the area you want to map and what is the step size you can control. So normally for a filter membrane, it takes uh, several minutes to scan through the surface. So this one is about, I would say, 10 times or 50 times faster than the other one because it has a, um, magnetic stage and also the CCD, um, EM CCD camera. So it's very fast. How sensitive is the XRF? The XRF, um, depending on the, the molecule, uh, not the element, heavy element, heavy metals like the arsenic, um, the ions, so those relatively heavier ones, the sensitivity is usually PPM. Lighter element like sodium is a challenge, which uh, the epsilon-4 has some troubles in getting an accurate quantification, but epsilon-1 that is able to quantify accurately um, the element. But mostly the sensitivity is between the PPM to percentage levels. But we have a developed a uh, approach that I have um, showing a little bit here in the end. Is for example, for the arsenic detection, the regulation is usually at a 10 ppb level, very low, right? So if you directly place the samples that the XRF is not that sensitive to detect 10 ppb level of inorganic arsenic. So we develop a method that we're using in chemistry to convert all the inorganic arsenic into the arson gas. Then we capture and concentrate this arson gas onto the membrane. Then we place the membrane for in the machine then because it's a concentrated into the PPM level. So we'll be able to detect the original 10 PPM concentration within the sample. Is there any sample preparation needed for the Raman or the XRF? Um, so basically no, no sample preparation needed unless you um, have uh, some um, challenge in terms of the sensitivity. Um, but if uh, the sensitivity is the, it's not an issue, you just directly put your samples into the machine. It's very easy. You don't need to have any sample preparation. Please, thank you. Any other questions? Julie, thank you. Great presentation. Do you, do you intend to run training courses for any of the equipment? Yes, we can provide training. Um, for the for the for the for you the, for any users to use uh, the equipment, um, so yeah, just to let uh, let me or let Josh know. So Josh is uh, the one that provide the trainings for the for using the equipment.
And before you're using our equipment, you need to uh, get the training anyway. Yeah. Perfect. Well, if that's it, no more questions, then we'll wrap this up. Thank you, Lily, so much for that informative okay. talk. Thank you all for attending today's seminar. Throughout the series, we will be featuring individual core facilities and their relevant technologies. Our next seminar is scheduled for Tuesday, November 17th, in which we will be learning about the services available in our biophysical characterization facility with Director Liz Bartlett. This facility houses 15 state-of-the-art instruments for the study of structures and interactions of biological macromolecules, such as proteins, nucleic acids, lipids, and complexes. This facility supports both discovery-based research and assay development for translational applications. So save the date and we hope to see you there. I also just wanted to note, as Andrew noted, this will be our last seminar in the series for the fall semester. We welcome your feedback on this new seminar series and are open to suggestions for topics and speakers for the spring 2021 semester lineup. Please reach out to me directly or fill out our survey located on the Core Facility Seminar webpage, which can be found from the IELTS homepage. Hope you're able to get out and enjoy this beautiful fall day. Goodbye, everybody.